thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to talk to you about a big plan to feed the world. This plan to feed the world troubles me, and I hope it will trouble you. Um, the reason it's troubling is because, well, you, you remember in 2007, 2008, there was the global food price crisis. Uh, and we were told that there were a billion people going hungry. Um, although those numbers have since been revised downward uh, through a, a magical bit of statistical recalibration by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and we can talk about that in a second if you like. But uh, it, things look pretty grim. Uh, and the, you know, a, a number of countries promised any amount of philanthropy and food aid uh, to, to solve the problem of global hunger. Uh, but the really big num money, the really big numbers of, uh, when it comes to sort of fighting hunger were only really released in 2012 uh, under the presidency of the, uh, when the US had the presidency of the Group of Eight, you know, the, the G8 country countries, the world's largest exporting economies. Um, and those, uh, th those countries met uh, in 2012 uh, in, in the United States. And then in, in tw 2013, when Britain had the presidency of, uh, of, of the G8, they met here. This is a very interesting place. Uh, this is a, a Bridewell Palace here. Uh, and then this is the Unilever building, palace, headquarters. Now, it, it's, it, it, what, what's very interesting about this is, it's, so th this happened at a, at a summit. Uh, it, it was called the British Hunger Summit, but its, its specific name was uh, Fighting Hunger with Business and Science. Uh, and uh, th this Fighting Hunger and Business and Science uh, conference began, and it was really set here in Bridewell Palace. Uh, and uh, the head of Unilever, Jan Pullman, comes up to the stand after, you know, the, 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 the conference begins with a very, very boring uh, presentation by Ban Ki-moon in which he's not allowed to move any muscle in his face. And he, 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 he <laughs> stares at the video camera and he's, he, he, he just refuses to, I mean, basically, but he moves his lips kind of, uh, but he says, I wish you well. For 20 minutes, he wishes people well. And then, then comes this thing at Bridewell Palace where Jan Pullman comes up and he says, well, here we are in Bridewell Palace. Uh, and, you know, we Unilever have manufactured so many things that are good for health, like flora margarine, you know, with, with full of trans fats and everything. We'll skip over that. Um, uh, uh, so they said, well, here we are in Bridewell Palace. And Bridewell Palace used to be uh, a, you know, one of Henry VIII's palaces. He used it as a, a place where he went to shag his mistresses. And then it, uh, then it just became a fun house. And then it became a, a prison and a debtor's prison and a brothel. And now it's Unilever. Uh, and I think he meant it to sort of signify a, a break. Uh, between the, the, the past and the present, though, uh, though in many ways it, it remains a place where people get shagged. Uh, because it, it's, it, 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 what, what was interesting about it is, if you, I mean, so, so he says, look, here we are, and we're going to business and science, we're going we're gonna to beat hunger together. Uh, and then um, th there are two people, Frank and Wajuma, uh, are brought up to the stage. And you know, I, I've written to uh, you know, the, 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 the secretariat for this conference and a few other people trying to find out what Frank and Wajuma's names were officially. Uh, Frank and Wajuma's never, again, never given second names, but they, they, they were young people from Tanzania who testified about the horrors of malnutrition. And they, they, they've lived through malnutrition and their parents were uh, malnourished. Uh, uh, sorry, their, their, parents were, their parents left to find work and they were uh, sent off with their grandparents and their grandparents were ill able to, to take care of them. And, and so Frank and Wajuma both independently were malnourished. Um, and they ended their testimony with a call for the group of eight countries to end malnutrition. And, and after that, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, bounded up to the stage uh, and he said, yes, Frank and Mwajuma, it's, it's a tragedy and it's not, just, uh, it's, it's not just bad for Frank and Mwajuma, but it's bad for their economies. Uh, and he, he then uh, reeled off a set of statistics along the lines of, you know, did you know that, that malnutrition costs the world $3.2 trillion every year? Do you, did you know that uh, the average malnourished person loses 20% uh, to 30% of their, their salary over a lifetime because of their malnutrition? Uh, because stunting has real and irreversible effects. Uh, the first th thousand days of life are incredibly important. And after that, uh, there are changes in the body that, that are fixed to, to, to the extent that you can trace out over the course of a lifetime, how economically damaging that can be. So he, he, he makes this case and then he ends with, and so we, the British government, because we have a history of being really nice to people, ha and you know, he, he, he has this sort of thing about, it's, that's just the right thing to do, being British. Uh, we, you know, we're just good people. Uh, you know, colonialism, colonialism, colonialism. Good, we're good people. And, um, and, and so you know, and he commits hundreds of millions of dollars. Now the largest part of the, uh, the British aid budget goes to something called the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. Um, 
And, and so it, it's important to say, well, so what is this fabulous thing that's going to, well, what's the alliance? I mean, food security and nutrition, these sound like fantastic things. We must have more of them. Uh, what is it that, it, uh, that th these things are? Um, so well, when the new alliance was launched, it was launched in the United States as a public-private partnership under the Obama administration. Um, and uh, the, the sort of front man was a guy called Raj Shah, who uh, is the administrator for the United States Agency for International Development, USAID. Um, and so w when, when he was sort of talking about the new alliance, w what he said was, look, what we need is public-private partnerships. You know, we are never going to end hunger in Africa without private investment. There are things that only companies can do, like building silos for storage and developing seeds and fertilizers. So what's interesting about that is it's wrong. That's a lie, actually. Uh, it, because if you think about the history of agricultural development in the 20, uh, 20th century, uh, when you think about the Green Revolution, who was it that built the silos for storage? Who was it that developed the seed and developed the fertilizer? It wasn't the private sector. It was foundations and uh, the public sector. Um, uh, specifically, when you think about the Green Revolution, you think about Norman Borlaug uh, working away in Mexico. Uh, he wasn't part of a corporation. He left DuPont to do that. Uh, he wasn't, uh, you know, and when you think about the silos, uh, the, the, the vast amount of silos in that time were public grain storage facilities. Uh, so to, to be able to talk about fertilizers and silos and seeds without, and, and, and doing it without possibly imagining the private sector to be involved is historically wrong. So then you've got to ask, well, why is he saying that? And the answer, it seems to me, is that he's not being historically accurate, but he's being politically accurate. It's not possible in the 21st century to think about doing this without thinking about the private sector. And incidentally, students, um, I'm going to have a go at you a little later on, but it, it's very interesting that, that in a lot of the students' response to this paper, students found it hard to think about doing things without the private sector. And I think that Raj Shah finds it hard to, to think about doing things without the private sector, even though historically that's kind of the way things have been done, and there's no really good reason why we should imagine the private sector integrally involved in this. It's hard to think about it otherwise. And this is, this is kind of exhibit A. I mean, it's hard for anyone in, in the United States now to think about doing things without involving the private sector. Uh, and it's important to understand why it is we, we, we're unable to imagine away the private sector or imagine a different role for the private sector. But it's also important to note that in making the justification for this new alliance where, where the private sector and the public sector need to be together, this is a justification. Historically, it's inaccurate, but it becomes a, a sort of a, a testament. So what is the New Alliance? Well, the New Alliance is a f it has a focused goal. What it wants to do is lift 50 million people from poverty by 2020. Now, of course, this is important because if you're interested in ending food security and malnutrition, it is absolutely important to understand that food security and malnutrition are about poverty. Poverty is the, is the, big, you know, is the, the big problem here. Um, and the way that the New Alliance wants to do this is uh, by mobilizing private capital, taking innovation to scale, and managing risk. Now, this, this all seems a bit vague, so, so let's, let's see, what, was it, what, does this, what, what does that mean? Um, well, th there was a, an interesting kind of amicus brief um, by the uh, German Marshall Fund, uh, and, and they, they put out a, a, a sort of covering analysis of the New Alliance, and it looks like this, it, in their economic policy paper series of 2013, they said, the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, it, pushing the frontier of enlightened capitalism. And I think that, 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 that's interesting, right? I mean, the idea is that capitalism heretofore hasn't been terribly enlightened, uh, and, and, and it, yet it might be. Uh, and so that's the promise of the New Alliance, is that, that capitalism might not only be in it for itself, but that there may be moments where capitalism and, and, and you know, helping people out of hunger might go hand in hand. We don't know, but it could be. And this is the frontier right here. Um, though oddly, um, the, the, the New Alliance is also built on a, a series of other uh, relationships and uh, uh, agreements in, uh, in uh, Africa, including one called the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. People heard of AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Um, it was funded, it was set up by the, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, it's headed now by Kofi Annan. And the idea is that uh, a, a few African leaders decided that they wanted um, you know, the, the kind of green revolution that, that, that they heard had worked so well in India and elsewhere. Um, uh, you know, ignoring the data in India around what the, the green revolution has cost and the fact that India still has more hungry people than the entirety of Africa, despite having been the epicenter of the green revolution. The, green, the, the mystique of the green revolution is still very powerful. So uh, th they wanted a green revolution in, uh, in Africa. And of course, the history of the Green Revolution is a history of subsidies, of population control, of uh, marketing and extension, occasionally, you know, seeds and fertilizer. But the seeds and fertilizer were, weren't as important as making sure that farmers had a place to sell their product. Um, 
All of this, of course, has been thrown out of the window. And, and the way that the people remember the Green Revolution in the 20th century, now, the way we think about the Green Revolution is, well, it was Norman Borlaug working very hard to grow these miracle white, you know, wheat and miracle rice, and there was fertilizer and pesticide and everything was, was great. In fact, the majority of the Green Revolution was about making sure that, that there was uh, social uh, and public sector infrastructure for all of the Green Revolution to happen. Point being uh, that uh, when you look at the, 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 the kinds of things that uh, the, this partnership is going to build on, it looks... I mean, it, look, it, looks, it looks a little different. I mean, th this is a, a report uh, about DFID, the Department for International Development, the, the British version of um, uh, the USAID. Uh, so th this is the, the, the international aid agency or the aid arm of uh, the British government. And uh, as, as the report notes, um, you know, th th there are these sort of agro dealers, these, these people who sell uh, seed and fertilizer. You know, in, in the past, it used to be the sort of public sector extension services that made these things available available uh, to some extent. Uh, but now, of course, all of it, is, uh, it has been privatized. Uh, and in, uh, and as, it, as it says here, Monsanto's country manager in Malawi admitted that all of Monsanto's sales are coming through this agro-dealer network. So Monsanto is doing quite well out of um, these, uh, these networks of investment in ending hunger in Africa and providing the, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. And this is kind of what we might expect from uh, the New Alliance. But uh, don't take it from me. Take it from the New Alliance itself. Here's, I, 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 you won't be able to read this, but I'll, I'll I, I, th there are three things that the Malawian government has to do in order to comply with the New Alliance, right? The, the, the Alliance partners will be put into place and there'll be money to make it happen. But the Malawian government has three jobs and three, uh, th these are, there are only three criteria by which it will be uh, judged to have succeeded or not succeeded, complied or not complied with the new alliance. And so the three things it has to do is, number one, improved score on doing business index among the top 100 economies. The second thing is increased dollar value of private sector investment in the agriculture sector and value added agro-processing. And the third thing is increased private investment in commercial production, sale of inputs and produce uh, and value addition. So, um, this, this, this sounds a little weird. I mean, you, you may think, well, you know, we, we started talking about hunger, but this seems to be about businesses. Uh, this seems to be all about the private sector. It doesn't really seem to be about a partnership so much as a capitulation. Um, and, and certainly that was one of the criticisms that circulated at the time that the new alliance was announced. Um, and so, there, very interestingly, an NGO, uh, an NGO called One, uh, you may have heard of them, uh, advertised by Bono and Jeffrey <coughs> Sachs occasionally, you know, interchangeably. Um, the one came up with a, this very interesting graph, and they said, no, 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 this isn't about, you know, foreign countries marching into Africa. Well, it is a little bit, uh, because, you know, w when you see uh, th th these sums of money, and of course, th these are out of date now, uh, th the Norwegian <coughs> company Yara, but this is, this is uh, the world's largest fertilizer company, um, providing most of the money from Norway, uh, and they've committed now near a $3 billion um, to this enterprise. Uh, Switzerland has Syngenta, and then, you know, we have various things in the United States. But, but one was keen to draw our attention to this bar over here, uh, which proves that it's not just about foreign companies, but African companies, too, are interested in, in the, the new alliance. And I think that, that I mean, it, it's interesting to take the Tanzanian example. Unfortunately, that, that turned out to be Swedish capital located in Tanzania. Uh, so this is actually Swedish money laundered through a Tanzanian front company. Um, but there are still, let's, let's take that out, but still, we've got this and, and, and a couple of those. Uh, and I think it's very interesting to, not just to read this as a kind of imperial foreign companies marching into Africa, because there is an African middle class. Um, it's very small, uh, but they are, uh, they are interested in this new configuration of, uh, of power and what, what it might allow them to, to do to w within their country. So, you know, th th there are lots of domestic Malawian companies that are interested in, in having foreign investment or, or uh, committing to this partnership and having the way smoothed for them. I mean, for example, th th this press agriculture one is very interesting because what they want to do is uh, make available, uh, they want to expand uh, seed production. And they, they want to do that on 50,000 hectares. Uh, now, seed production is, you know, it re requires good quality land. And in order for them to get good quality land, they need to have land from somewhere. Now, the thing about good quality land is people generally know where it is, and they generally tend to farm on it. Uh, and so uh, one of the stories we've, we've heard, what we heard when they were there, and next time I'm back, I'm going to be going down there to verify, is 
uh, that uh, you know th there was a, a village headman whose uh, land was on the border uh, who, who was was riverfront property, so there was good access to water. Uh, and he, in uh, the hunger season, the, 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 the period of the year but, you know, where uh, you're just before harvest and you've run down your stocks, uh, the, the, the hunger season was, uh, was, put, was pretty bad last year, uh, and people went to the village headman asking for food. And he, instead of giving them food, he gave them cash, which was unusual, but was, was welcome. Um, and, uh, and so people went out and, and bought food with it. Uh, and then they discovered that it, the, the, the cash was actually payment for them to move away from their land so their land could be bought by a foreign multi national. Now, th this idea of land grabs in Africa um, is, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's something that is actually uh, pretty uh, of a piece with this new alliance, because making these resources available is what the new alliance is, is interested in doing. I mean, that's one of the commitments that the government makes by joining the new alliance. The, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is very keen on this. Uh, in, the, in their um, uh, in, in their documents, they talk about land mobility. Um, which is, uh, which is Bill and Melinda Gates speak for uh, where the land stays where it is, but the people who are on the land are made mobile um, so that uh, they, uh, you know, so, so that more, more efficient use of the land can be made. Um, so, you know, you, you have your foreign and your domestic multinational. Now, the, the reason I wanted to mention this is just because, you know, often in these stories it's, you know, Malawians are all good and everyone outside of Malawi is very bad. Uh, but this is a complex story. This is a story that involves a local bourgeoisie. It is a story that involves uh, people who want to make their way in the world. A, a, a story of people who see opportunities in this new alliance uh, and opportunities to be able to make money and create jobs and perhaps then to be able to give people jobs who will then be able to be lifted out of poverty. Uh, and therefore, hunger and nutrition will be ended. So this isn't a, just a sort of good guy, bad guy story. Um, it's a very complex and interlocking kind of story in which, uh, you know, I mean, in which Malawians, for example, are allowed to be corruptible. In fact, they have to be corruptible. The, 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 the story of the Malawian government after all this is uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the, the president, Joyce Banda, was deposed um, well, not deposed, she, she was elected out of office because of a huge scandal called Cashgate. Um, the, in which most, you know, the 20% the of government funding uh, w w sort of seems to have disappeared, uh, but most of it went to services that, uh, to you know, uh, paid for to agencies friendly to the government, um, but for, for services were never delivered. So you know, it's possible for there to be you know bad people in government in Malawi, just as it's possible for there to be um, you know sort of people rubbing their hands with glee outside Malawi at the prospect of this new alliance. So I just want to set that up. Um, because the interesting question, and one that I'm, I'm, I'm going to speed along now, because I think this, this is the interesting question, is, look, I, I've just been talking about business for half an hour, uh, and the problem is that we haven't really talked about why this is the new alliance for food security and nutrition. What's, what's the nutritionness of this? Well, there are two things that, that appeared in the, in the document uh, associated with this that, that I think are important. One is this. Um, salt. Uh, the new alliance suggests uh, that what needs to happen is that salt be fortified with iodine. Now, this is a terrific idea. Uh, no one disputes that having uh, iodine-fortified salt helps to reduce some of the diseases that uh, accompany um, uh, iodine depriva deprivation. Trouble is, of course, to be able to buy salt, you need a job uh, and you need money. And uh, th th this, this isn't terribly helpful if you, are, if, if you, if you remain cripplingly poor. Uh, similarly, uh, I, I could, this is the, I, th there isn't really a good picture of maternity leave. Uh, this is the best thing I could find uh, on <laughs> Flickr. Um, but but point, the, the maternity leave is an important part of, of what the government has promised to do, uh, to increase maternity leave from six weeks to some unspecified number. Um, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's better than the maternity leave we get in the United States if that, uh, if, if that ends up happening. And I think that's a tremendous idea. But bear in mind that this only affects 2.5% of the, the female population. Now, this isn't to say that 2.5% of the female population ought not to be given maternity leave. Of course they should. And, uh, of course, we, we need maternity leave uh, if we're interested in fighting malnutrition. The thing is that if you are in formal employment, the chances of your being malnourished and your children being malnourished are far less than if you are uh, in the informal sector and if you're a subsistence farmer where the majority of poverty is. Now, this isn't to say, again, just to be clear, that I'm against maternity leave, um, because I'm not. Uh, I think maternity leave is a good thing. Let, 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 it, let it be known. Um, but, but it's just, it's, it's weird that this is, these are the two uh, sort of policies, iodine uh, for fortification on salt and um, the, this maternity leave thing. Uh, and again, it, it betrays the fact that this is a, a policy geared more towards middle class Malawians than it is towards the Malawians who are going to be suffering malnutrition. But 
It's interesting that it fits into this larger story of a word. There's a term, nutritionism. Have people read Michael Pollan use this term? Um, so Michael Pollan, uh, we, we, people have heard of Michael Pollan. Okay, if you haven't heard of Michael Pollan, Michael Pollan is a, a, a food writer for the New York Times, among other places. Uh, he's written widely on the, the global food, oh, sorry, on, on the US food system. One of the terms he uses is nutritionism, and it comes from a guy called Georgi Skrinis, uh, who, who talks about nutrition as this reductive focus on uh, the nutrient composition of food as the means for understanding its healthfulness, as well as a reductive interpretation of the role of these uh, nutrients in bodily health. And he writes about it in a book called Nutritionism, which I recommend. Um, now, nutritionism doesn't come from nowhere. It, it, it's, it's an idea that's historically, of course, been about technologies of control. I mean, the idea of vitamins uh, and adding vitamins to food uh, has a lot to do with military preparedness in the United States and in, uh, uh, and in the United Kingdom. Um, but there's a very interesting moment, and since we're in a, a center that's about human rights, I, I wanted to sort of talk about a, a moment in which human rights considerations about hunger gets trumped by other kinds of considerations. And, and that moment happens just when you expect it is, where, where expect it would, which is around the end of the Cold War and the beginning of this sort of period of the heyday of neoliberalism in the United States. Um, and it happens, uh, it is reported on by um, the Hawaiian academic Aya Hirata Kimura. Uh, and she talks about this very interesting moment when the World Bank uh, starts to worry about hunger. Uh, and, you know, the, the Berlin Wall is down, the Soviet Union's collapsed, it's just a sort of smoking pile over which Jeffrey Sachs is, um, you know, providing his consulting services. Uh, and, and, and there's a moment where it's obvious to the United States, and particularly to the uh, a sort of generation of economists uh, in, uh, in the World Bank, that what they have to do is end hunger. And they get, they get to have this clean slate of ending hunger. And they, they adopt the kinds of ideas that circulated at the time, which is, well, we, we must have public-private partnerships. We must work together with the, the, you know, bring the public and the private together. And we're going to, uh, we're going to end hunger. Uh, and they, they've, they, they start writing this very interesting document about nutrition and nutrients. Um, and it, they publish it in 1994. And they, they, they have the ki these kinds of quotes where uh, the, the, the name of the document is called Enriching Lives. And they say things like, deficiencies of just vitamin A, iodine, and iron could waste as much as 5% of gross domestic product. But addressing them comprehensively and sustainably would cost less than 0.3% of GDP. Now, I, I just want to point out how weird that is. Because uh, when we're talking about addressing hunger historically, and this may be a generational thing, I don't know, but when I was growing up, saying something like that would be considered callous. Yeah. Saying something like that would be, w w would be considered uh, just beyond the pale because the main reason hunger is bad is not because it is a, a, a sacrifice of gross domestic product or even just a, an unwise use of gross domestic It's not even just bad economic. The reason that hunger is bad is because it is a violation of the right to hunger. It, it's it's a, an insult to someone's dignity. Now, what happens historically in this moment is that those kinds of concerns are being assaulted by a, a, an economism. Uh, a, a, an approach of thinking about the world that is not about the, I mean, it's not incompatible with, uh, you know, of course it's unjust, also it's a bad economics. But this is a kind of dog whistle because it, this isn't about, uh, this isn't addressing us as human beings sitting around here saying, well, of course hunger is bad and it is a violation of the right to food that so many people go hungry in the world. This is a dog whistle for the business community because what, uh, what, what emerges at the, around about the same time um, is the business line for the fortification, sorry, for food and fortification headed by these three companies, Coke, Danone, and Unilever. Uh, and they respond uh, to the World Bank's document with uh, uh, one of their own, where they, they, they take forward the idea of fortification in food. Uh, and they say, well, actually, we're ready to help because companies already own the right technology to make a difference, as well as the distribution channels and communications networks. So uh, I, you know, I think this is interesting because Businesses here, this is a bad, you know, the, the, you know, governments are ready to make investments in order to be able to increase uh, you know, returns on, uh, in, you know, on investments in nutrition. Uh, and companies here, well, of course, you know, give your money to us and we've, you know, because basically what we can do is add vitamins to our stuff and then we can sell it. And we already have the technology to do that. And we already have the marketing to be able to reach people. Win, win, win. Um, now, I mean, the, the logical extension of this, if, if this seems like, oh, well, this is all very abstract. Um, do, do people here remember Diet Coke Plus? <laughs> Diet Coke Plus, if, if, if you weren't, uh, it, it sort of flashed up in the, in, in the aisles and then was laughed away. But, but for a very brief while, you in the United States, you could have Diet Coke Plus, which is 
uh, you know, your regular sort of Diet Coke, plus added vitamins and minerals uh, so that you could drink your chemistry set uh, and, uh, and, and, and lead a healthy and fulfilled life and still have zero calories. Uh, now, that was the, the, the sort of the business response to this call for uh, increased nutrients in food. Uh, it, it's, it's not a, a, a let's transform poverty, but it's more, hey, wait, we can help with this, this communications and with this fortification thing. We can do that. Uh, and that's what's very interesting about this, this historic moment uh, at the end of the, 19, uh, sorry, the beginning of the, the 1990s, the end of the Cold War, where there is a transformation in the way that hunger and nutrition is understood. So, um, sorry, that date should be 1995, not 2005. So, uh, th th this brings us back to the end uh, uh, of um, the, this brings us back to the Hunger Summit, because what, it, it, it seems to me that there's, a, it, there's an interesting question. What are Frank and Wajuma, that's Frank and Wajuma there, what are Frank and Majuma doing at the Hunger Summit? They're there to testify about their hunger, but they're not there really to give any ideas about how to tackle it. Their job is to be bodies on a stage. Um, the, the, their role in uh, this Hunger stum Summit was a kind of habeas corpus, right? The, the, they have to, their bodies have to be shown on stage so that then other people can come in and save the day. There's, there's an epistemology, there's a way of knowing and understanding the problems of hunger, where you present the body and then action will happen as a result of that. The king will decide what, what it is that needs to be done. Uh, but there's no, uh, th their brains, their thinking, their ideas, their politics, their rights matter not at all. It's just their suffering. That, uh, that, that then is, you know, is, appealed, is used as the basis of an appeal, uh, and then there will be transformation that happens as a result. They will become the bodies into which money is invested. Uh, and in fact, the, the other uh, uh, um, uh, sponsors of this, this, uh, this fighting hunger with business and science, the, the other sponsors of the summit were called the Children's Investment Fund, which again, 20 years ago, would have been considered you know, the, the, the subject of a Monty Python joke. Uh, wait, 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 we're investing in children. Well, in fact, th th it is the subject of a Monty Python joke. I, 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 I'm just, just remembering. Do you remember the, the, the Monty Python joke about uh, you know, wh where, where a nice man comes into the, the tax office, uh, the, the, so into the merchant banker's office, and said, I, I'm, I'm here to collect money for children. Uh, and he's, well, is it a tax dodge? Uh, and he goes, no, 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 it's just for the children. Said, well, you're making no sense to me. Get out. And of course, he, you know, he, a lever is pulled and the man disappears through the floor. Um, but, but essentially, now children are a tax dodge. Um, and I, 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 next time I do this presentation, I'm going to use that clip because it's, it's brilliant. Anyway, uh, so, so, b b point being, um, we're now entering an era in which the, uh, Frank and Wajuma's poverty really is off the table. Uh, what we need to do is just fix their bodies so that they are able to survive this poverty. This is the era of poverty with added vitamins. Now, I'm going on way too long, but I'd really love to be able to show this film clip of the other... Can, can I... Okay, so, so I, I want to leave on a downer. Uh, so, so what I'd like to do is just sort of counterpose this with an alternative. Um, which uh, emerges from Malawi uh, also at the, uh, at the end of the 1990s when uh, you know, hunger is you know, rife, where the HIV AIDS epidemic is rampant and life expectancy is 48 years old, uh, where 50% of children are malnourished. Um, as, as some nurses and uh, some activists <coughs> in a, a pediatric <coughs> malnutrition unit um, decide that they want to end hunger. And they, they decide they want to do that by... Um, uh, essentially by, by growing better crops. And so they, they figured out ways of increasing uh, crop production. They, they intercrop. They become farmer scientists. Because, you know, the, the agricultural extension services that would normally teach farmers how to do all this, all of that's been defunded. There's very little money to do this. So farmers themselves become scientists. And you have 5,000 farmers uh, becoming experimenters in the in the sort of peer-to-peer -peer network of, of farming and agricultural research and so they you know they they get seeds and they they you know they learn about uh, native american crop planting so you know you have the three sisters of, of corn of squash and of beans uh, so you, you, you plant the corn because you want the corn is the staple food in malawi and then squash uh, is fantastic it also uh, shades out weeds and then the beans fix nitrogen in the soil uh, and, and and helps uh, improve soil quality and you, i mean i've seen better uh, three sisters plant planting in Malawi than I've seen in, you know, in, in some parts of Mexico. It's an amazing uh, series of interventions where people figure out what works. So th th they've been doing that. Um, and they, uh, they, they, they 
make the, the, they basically get together and uh, have these sort of farmer scientists days, and so they they work on their crop diversification. Um, but they also, uh, and I guess uh, some of you will know the answer to this already, but those of you who don't, I mean, you, there, there is this problem. that they, they were doing so well, they had uh, as much corn as before, and they, they outperform industrial agriculture with this agroecological technique. Um, but they also, and, you know, and they have 40% more protein, uh, but they, uh, they have a problem, which is that you have all this food and child or infant malnutrition remains high. So how is it that you can have more food and infant malnutrition remains high? Not going to the right people? No, because this is for, for domestic consumption. Yes, breastfeeding. So the, the, the problem is that um, you have, uh, that harvesting is women's work. And harvesting is women's work, but so is carrying water and fetching firewood uh, and cooking and, uh, and breastfeeding. And so when there's more harvesting to do, because there's more food, uh, then, and, you know, and you still have to fetch firewood and cook and, wa and carry water, then the breastfeeding can go down. So the farmers themselves come up with this idea of, well, you know, initially they say, well, you know, we're going to teach the men to cook by going door to door uh, with a, you know, the food network style, you know, and, and with a chef. And uh, you know, they'd they knock on the door and they'd be like, uh, you know, hello, man of the house, come out here. You, know, you may have seen your wife hunched over this. It's a pot. Uh, and then the man would be like, oh yeah, I've, I've often wondered how that worked. Um, and, uh, and so you know, there'd be a cooking lesson and then, uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, and then it'd be like, bye-bye, see, you've changed my life forever. Uh, and of course, nothing would change. Uh, because just like the Food Network, it was a sort of moment of entertainment. It wasn't about transformation. So instead what they do is come up with these things called recipe days, where people do it together, where women and men and kids are part of a community of social change. Uh, and these, these moments become prefigurative communities. They become spaces where there is equality. Uh, and that equality is enjoyed f in the moment that it exists. And you know, women can call out men on our shit. But also, you know, mothers-in-law get to be called out by daughters-in-law uh, around bad breastfeeding practices. And you end up with a an amazing series of interventions that then are followed by hard feminist organizing door to door. And uh, th we have some data around uh, the, the extent to which f uh, families do well under this, and we're, we're, we're ex expanding the, 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 the data set to be able to, to really make some rigorous claims around this. Um, but we've, you know, th th there's, there's been an, an amazing amount that's come out of this peer-to-peer -peer science network, where, where people are not, where the experts are not the people in London who want to fight with business and science, but when the farmers themselves get to uh, figure, fi you know, figure out solutions, uh, have you know, experts available. I mean, there's nothing anti-scientific about this. You know, they, they want to know what kind of crops grow well with other crops and where to, you know, they, you, you'll see in, in a clip that I'll just show you. Soybeans. You know, soybeans don't come anywhere from, uh, any, from anywhere near Malawi, but people are using them and are excited by them and you know, are sharing varieties. Uh, but uh, point being, this is a, a, a series of interventions where people don't always get the right answers, but they iterate and they get to make mistakes. Uh, you know, it's j just like the Wendell Berry uh, sort of exhortation of be like a fox, make many tracks, some in the wrong direction, uh, practice resurrection. And, 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 and that's what this, you know, the, 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 the idea here is the, the, the community is actually, you know, figuring out its part. Um, but it's much more in control of its destiny uh, than, you know, than it would be certainly under the new alliance. And they use peer-to-peer -peer knowledge, uh, you know, mechanisms to share knowledge. They confront patriarchy, and that's very important, because if you're interested in ending hunger, uh, you need to know that 60% of people going hungry in, to, in the world today are women or girls. And they share these new uh, feeding practices, and they use this essentially as, as a platform for politics and for transformation. So that's the, um, I mean, if, if, if you want uplift, um, then you shouldn't be watching a Steve Damon's film. But, 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 it, uh, but, but also, I mean, I, I think what, what, what's interesting is that this year, you, you, we, we've, you know, we've gone back several years, uh, and uh, Jennifer's actually doing very well. Uh, uh, Winston is, uh, in, it would appear, incorrigible. And so she's just going alone. Uh, and you know, the, the, you know, what, what recipe days offer isn't couples therapy, it's women's empowerment. Uh, and I think that that's tremendously important because uh, the, the idea here is th that uh, it is through women's empowerment that you find uh, the, the, the kinds of results that you see here. And I, I, I'm running way too late to w walk through some of this. Um, but basically, the, the idea here is that you're seeing here um, improve, improvements in uh, mean weight for age Z scores, uh, so uh, objective measures of malnutrition uh, that you, you would struggle to find in any other single intervention uh, that, uh, th that you, you might find in terms of fighting malnutrition. You, you, you won't get this by adding vitamins to anything. 
Uh, this is the kind of intervention uh, that, that revolves around women's empowerment and therefore uh, the ending of poverty, the increasing of w household welfare, the uh, increased amount of time for, um, for breastfeeding, but also a range of other uh, political changes that come from these recipe days. Um, and we can talk about those uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the discussion. But I do want to address just an, a, a few problems um, because folk have, have, have raised, uh, and I'm really grateful for the student papers, by the way, because it, it, it's really surfaced for me some, some of the, the, the areas where I, I need to you know, strengthen this argument. Um, because uh, some have said, well, you know, the, w what I'm doing is, is advocating the, the expulsion of billions of dollars of, uh, of charity uh, and philanthropy in, in the fight against malnutrition here. Um, and I'm not, I'm not really, uh, I mean, see, the thing with philanthropy is it's the opposite of democracy. Philanthropy is what Bill Gates decides to do. And uh, I've got a problem with that, and I think you should too. Uh, because uh, although, you know, uh, God, this, this campus is so crappy. Uh, I have to say, uh, you know, uh, trying to find the law school is impossible, just as you know, trying to find the public affairs school. It's always named after someone who gave a ton of cash, right? Uh, it, 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 uh, I mean, I was telling Billy that if you want, I mean, the, what the map of this campus is good for is figuring out which families to hit up for cash as you, as you walk around Austin. Um, <laughs> But, but it's not actually good for finding your way around campus. Uh, but it's, it's a reminder that we've built into our everyday lives the idea that what we need to be doing is supplicating to rich families to be able to get shit done. And that's not okay. Uh, what's, what's not okay is the idea that we, you know, that, that we don't have public funds to be able to build a good university campus. Instead, we must go to this rich person or this rich person or this rich person. So in a sense, philosophically, I'm fine with billions of dollars of philanthropic cash to be kicked out of Africa. But the other thing I'm fine with uh, is debt repayment. I, I'm fine for us in the global north to be repaying the debt that we owe the global south. I, I, you know, it, we shouldn't be thinking about philanthropy for Africa. We need to be thinking about reparations. So already to be falling into this idea of, well, poor Africa, what do they do without our money, uh, is already to have gotten this ass backwards. Uh, because what we really need to be thinking is, what the hell are we doing sitting on top of you know, the, 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 the tantalum in your cell phone coming from Africa? And do you know how much suffering that that involves? We need to be paying back to Africa rather than be thinking about, well, what will they do without our cash? Um, the second thing is, a, a lot of people worry, well, what, so how are you going to make this big? You know, at least Coke has scale, they're everywhere. Uh, and these people have just, like, 5,000 farmers, I've admitted as much. But in fact, what's interesting about this is two things. One, it's spreading from uh, northern Malawi uh, down south because it has been so successful. I mean, some, some of this data is nearly 10 years old, and it's uh, already on the march further down south. And it is successful because, of course, you know, the, well, I mean, the pediatric malnutrition unit has closed down for want of new cases from this area. Show me that kind of uh, you know, response and that kind of efficacy with uh, the new Alliance for uh, Food Security and Nutrition. But the other thing is, of course, um, what's interesting is you can scale this. Uh, and it is being scaled. The idea, well, what's interesting about this model is that you have agroecology and peer-to-peer -peer networks where you have farmers learning from each other and you have uh, gender rights becoming front and center. Well, there's an organization that's already been scaling this for 10 years. La Via Campesina has 200 million members uh, around the world of farmers and farm workers um, who are already in the process of building this out. Uh, you know, show me that kind of return when you know, the, 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 the New Alliance wants to get 50 million people out of poverty by 2020. This is going much faster faster and much bigger. So again, I push back on that idea of scale. Some people say, well, you know, this doesn't address the needs of the 5.5 the million uh, women in Malawi, but the, the half a million women who are in formal employment. Yes, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm down with that. I, th I think, yes, we need, uh, we, we need uh, women's rights for everyone, not just for the rich, but for everyone. And finally, uh, th th there's this idea about privileging the, the sort of boots on you know, the, 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 the dusty, authentic, agrarian alternative as opposed to uh, the, the new technocratic alternative. And again, I, 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 I want to dispute that. I mean, there's nothing traditional about uh, women fighting patriarchy in, in this agrarian context. I mean, there's, there's something very 21st century about this. Uh, th th there's nothing kind of, well, you know, this is how they always used to do it, and we must go back to that past because it was so awesome. Th th I mean, the thing that, that mm. absolutely, when you want to think about a, a brave agrarian future that you don't want to replicate from the past is patriarchy. Uh, and here we have examples of women, of, of women organizing, using feminist organizing to be able to overcome that. And I think that there's nothing uh, you know, sort of authentically rural or agrarian about that necessarily. Um, and technocracy is, again, something that's, that's a problem. I, I, I'm not sure we should be celebrating the idea that, you know, boffins in Redmond, uh, Washington, or wh wherever it is, you know, the, the, the people with the geniuses behind the seed should be allowed to run agriculture policy in Africa. I think maybe 
people closer to Africa should be doing that. Maybe Africans. Maybe people who are, uh, who are democratically connected to a constituency where they're not afraid of technology. Again, hybrid soy seeds, you saw them there. Uh, people aren't afraid of those things, but people want to control them. And I think th th it's the crussy and technocracy that I find a problem. I mean, technology is great. But technocracy seems to me the opposite of democracy, and I have a problem with that as well. Um, oh, and finally, yes, I mean, people are excited about the, the private sector. And I, I, I want to end with something that isn't about the New Alliance, but brings the New Alliance home to us here. I mean, if we're interested in you know, the, the role of the private sector in making America healthier, making the world healthier, um, I just want to show you this graph from the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. Um, I, I, you know, for, for those who would want to put their faith in the private sector, um, this is... Uh, th this is high comedy. Um, the, I mean, the American <laughs> Journal of Preventive Medicine is, is not a gag fest. Uh, but but, w but w what it shows is it basically th there's this thing called the, the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation that in 2010 announced that it was going to uh, sell 1.5 trillion calories less uh, because you know, the, the, you know, Nestle and Danone and Coke and Pepsi, the head of the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation is the head of Pepsi as well, Indra and Lee. Uh, they said, yes, so we, we recognize that maybe there are too many calories being sold in the United States, and so what we're going to do is sell fewer of them. Uh, and it was, it was announced earlier on this year in a report that the um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, published that, in fact, they hadn't just sold uh, 1.5 trillion calories. There were 6.4 trillion calories less they had sold. Um, it's like uh, four towers of Empire State Building-sized cups of Coke, uh, or you know, if you prefer your if you, a different metaphor, it's like three quarters of an Empire State Building made of lard. Uh, they they made they sold that many fewer calories, and so yeah, there was confetti and free Pepsi. Uh, and, uh, but what's interesting is, so, so this, this graph is very interesting because what it shows is, look, here's the trend line. Here's the trajectory that uh, Pepsi, uh, that, that uh, in this case, soda sales um, and uh, packaged good beverage uh, calories uh, w were on. And then here's what was actually sold by the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation. Um, and what this suggests is that actually it's better for the, uh, for the private sector to do nothing uh, than it is, because this is the, the trend line, had they done nothing, and here's, where, here's what they actually ended up doing. Um, and and I, I think that, that it, it, what, what this graph for me sort of points to is the sort of contradiction between asking for-profit enterprises uh, to tackle an issue that's about poverty, exploitation, and inequality. Uh, and uh, this isn't to say the private sector has absolutely no role to play, it's just that that role needs to be democratically circumscribed. And unless we are happy to regulate and limit the, uh, the power of corporations to exploit people, uh, then I'm afraid we're not, gonna have, you know, we're not going to be able to make claims about rights that are not about property rights. And what we're interested in, it seems to me, if, particularly in a, in a center that's interested in human rights, is something beyond property rights. We need to be thinking about the right to food and the right to, you know, the, the right to water. And those kinds of rights, it seems to me, may not be compatible with the private sector. And insofar as they are not, the private sector must give, not the rights. Thanks very much. That was really exciting, and largely because I think that um, Raj and I come from a very similar place of um, wanting to combat some of the most egregious effects of neoliberalism on the planet today and trying to do in both our academic and our activist work um, some kind of critical thinking about the consequences of um, of what neoliberalism has meant for the overwhelming majority of people on the planet. My current research is actually on slums in India um, and about the ways that poverty um, is talked about in India, but also how solutions to poverty in India are, are imagined. And what it struck me while listening to Raj's paper is how similar kinds of, I guess, nutritionism adjacent ideologies are put forward when you try to think about poverty reduction. So the um, solution du jour for poverty in uh, South Asia um, is actually this thing called microcredit or microenterprises and the kind of ways that microcredit and microenterprises have been uh, pushed um, as a, a solution to lifting lots and lots of people out of poverty uh, by injecting small amounts of capital and giving people some control over money and credit that they didn't have access to. Um, it's been a very interesting way that these public-private partnerships have crept into even something like poverty reduction. So you have the kind of ridiculously um, 
weird oxymoron of capitalism trying to solve the problems that capitalism created, um, the sort of uh, ways that we imagine um, or think through the questions of poverty, very interesting. It's also um, uh, stuff in the sort of economics literature has been critiqued um, in the ways that we think about yeah. development and growth and why the kind of chasing after development and growth doesn't always, actually never yields poverty reduction in the rates that, um, the rates that we're seeking. But I wanted to begin in a sort of historical point because um, I think that part of the place where Raj and I may disagree a little, or maybe we can be in productive conversation about this, is that I deal mostly with urban poverty, and Raj seems to be looking a lot at rural poverty, and the kinds of solutions that are appropriate for rural poor and rural hunger will be very different. I mean, if you can imagine slum dwellers attempting something like the you know, food production in, in Dharavi in Bombay, for instance, it's a harder thing to imagine exactly what that would look like. But I wanted to start with the Green Revolution. Um, the Green Revolution is a really in important historical thing to get your head around um, when you think about historically, uh, his not just historically what this does for food production, which is it increases pretty substantially in the 70s and 80s food production um, in places which aren't producing enough food for their own populations. Um, but what it doesn't do is actually solve poverty. So um, in the injection of um, technical inputs into agricultural production in the 70s and 80s in India meant things like um, loans for tractors, pesticides, seeds, and the production of roads and storage facilities to allow that grain and or whatever else they were making to come to market. Such kinds of massive uh, capital investments in agriculture had the twin effect of both increasing agricultural production, but also displacing and putting out of work millions of people who were agricultural workers or small farmers. So big big agribusiness buys up the land, it pushes people off the land, those people then move to the cities and populate slums. Um, this, in case you want the sort of um, more elegant version of the story, is told by Mike Davis in Planet of the Slums, which came out a few years back. It's a very interesting thing to sort of think through. But part of the reason that that happens um, is because of these food crises. So in one sense, we can think of historically, the Green Revolution was an attempt to manage food shortages. India was going through one of these in the, in the 80s. And so more um, investments of this kind happened in, uh, happened in India. Um, in the 80s, we produced a problem uh, in India of massive hunger moving from uh, uh, the villages and moving then into the city. So I think that this is all really interesting to think through in context, the language that we have about development um, and why we chase after development, why development is given a suffering poor face as opposed to what development usually is, which is the rich getting absolutely filthy richer, or why microcredit has been promoted as a solution for poverty because we know that in the era of neoliberalism, the state is made completely ineffectual at resolving questions of long-term and systemic poverty, microcredit is seen as a kind of panacea, even though we know from most case studies that most microenterprises, something like 70 to 80% of them are failures because this is the nature of capitalism. Competition drives people out of business and the products that are made um, uh, uh, go unsold. Most microcredit, most microenterprises are failure, but perversely, and this is where I think we should think through the question of women's empowerment very, very specifically, microcredit has been, especially folks um, who have read stuff about uh, uh, um, Muhammad Yunus and uh, the Grameen Bank know that microcredit is normally promoted as a way to in, uh, in improve women's empowerment. It is usually credit given to women. It is usually credit given to small um, uh, small banks and villages run by women, and women make the decisions about how money should be parceled out. In Bangladesh, it has had the perverse effect of increasing the amount of domestic violence against women as men beat their wives for control over money that is not going to smaller households. We should really think through the question of women's empowerment and what what kinds of work that that does to get our support for certain kinds of policies. And the reason I raise that is not because I think that the um, story that is being told in the video isn't a great story, it's a, it's a fantastic story, but we should also ask why it is that the narrative around women's empowerment is actually about labor extraction. Right? So everything that is being asked of people is work harder, do more. You have to make more possible by thinking of yourselves now as either egalitarian or um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a harder worker doing the work that the state is not willing to do. So it is a kind of narrative about the extraction of more labor to make the land more productive. And there are, there, I imagine, social consequences to that that are worth us also parsing out and thinking through. The second point that I'd like to make is about um, 
about like how we think about poverty. I, and I think that there has been really good new work, um, and Raj's work is, of course, a, a part of this, about a multidimensional thinking about poverty. So in India, perversely, poverty was reduced um, in the manner in a five-year span, literally by changing the definition of poverty. So poverty went from being uh, somebody who consumes, uh, who lives on $2 a day or less to somebody who lives on $1.50 a day or less. And you lower the poverty rate and immediately you've solved the problem of poverty. I think nutritionism is a similar kind of thing. You change the kind of bundle of ingredients that you need to consume on a daily basis and you know you've solved the problem of nutrition and hunger multidimensional poverty is a very interesting thing to think about in the sense because it's not simply access to money but also education electricity sanitation housing food the whole lot of it and lots of really interesting i think new work is being done to think through what a full package of multidimensional poverty solutions would look like which also force us to think through the question of what poverty um, really means. And this, I think, will lead into the last two points that I kind of, I kind of want to make, which have to do with whether or not it's possible to imagine solutions to hunger while capitalism still exists. Um, because where Raj begins is probably the place that we ought to think about the problems for the folks in Malawi. If the plan of the new alliance is actually to engineer state-sponsored sanctions, uh, sanctioned land grabs, which will allow new investments to take place for more productive, uh, intensive, capital-driven agriculture to happen. How is it possible to imagine a small village doing this kind of work to make the soil more um, productive, to make it more fertile, et cetera, will not be within the targets of what agribusiness is going to go after. And then you have a situation like what you have in India, which is a full-on civil war between the, uh, the indigenous folks in the forest and the multinational companies who are attempting to grab their land. So there are real sort of social situations and social problems that we need to address as a part of the narrative about what neoliberalism is doing in its quest for access to the commons and its quest for raw materials and its quest for labor, that simply um, thinking about a, a, a kind of prefigurative space in which, again, really remarkable work is being done, cannot be the whole story of how we understand the circuits of capital accumulation and their consequences for people. And this, I think, leads to the fourth and last um, uh, set of, of, of observations that I have that I think, um, and again, I, I say this as somebody who would happily fight alongside Raj on any number of protests, uh, things that we would, um, I think we probably have uh, protested together at a, at a number of things. Um, um, I think that prefigurative politics are very, very dangerous because they present a, a kind of version of if only we all did X, we could solve the problem. And the problem here, it seems to me, is highly, highly systemic. Um, it is a system problem that, of capitalism that it is organized to do certain things. Um, and it is not simply a solution of, you know, kind of community reorganization or pockets of um, pockets of land and uh, people outside of capitalism that can solve larger problems which are connected to what capitalism actually does. Those people in the video are really good examples of this. This is not sort of a kind of, I don't know, aboriginal community free from capitalism that you're seeing. They all are wearing uh, clothes that are produced in sweatshops, most likely because they are poor and that's what they can afford. Um, uh, uh, built, living in houses that have some kind of, you know, industrial, materials that are in them. The solutions to whatever we think of um, about poverty will require a kind of systemic challenge to capitalism. And while prefigurative politics are very useful in explaining what is wrong with what capitalism is, is doing and why some kinds of private interventions into poverty reduction schemes are wrong, I think, I think there's a real danger in, um, in, th in using uh, prefigurative politics as a kind of solution that we can hope for uh, will spread and challenge capitalism organically. Um, I think that Challenge to capitalism is a thing that we also have to organize alongside supporting these sorts of community um, uh, community organizing efforts. And this brings me, I think, to the last problem, which is Raj's solution presupposes that people have at least access to one resource, and that is land. Um, and it presupposes that people have the ability to use that land for their own purposes and to farm and, and you know, deploy that land for the interests that they, uh, that they so choose. Land tenure is a very serious problem for the overwhelming majority of people who are not just food poor, but also land poor in uh, the world today. And so even if we can imagine a situation in which um, 
200,000 uh, members of Via Campesina are able to have access to some plots of land and engage in some kind of subsistence agriculture which allows them to feed themselves, that is not the case for the overwhelming majority of poor that exists in the world. Some, uh, depending on how we calculate it, two to, two to three and a half billion people in the world who don't have access to land, don't have access to formal employment, and certainly don't have access to social services that would allow them to survive their landlessness and food poverty. So I think that what what's excellent about this paper is it forces it forced me anyway to think through some of the ways that I had been kind of glib about what counts as a poverty reduction scheme to get behind or be supportive of it definitely puts into context what is wrong with a number of the NGO led strategies for um, NGO and I guess in this case it's government led because it's the G8 that's doing it so it's not even really NGO um, in that context um, but it doesn't really sort of solve the problem of how we end poverty fully and how we sort of engage the question of food insecurity for everybody. What it does is, I think, begin a conversation about how we think through critically uh, the discourses, the rationales, and the kind of ideologies under which we are allowed to feel good that po poverty reduction or hunger reduction is happening. But in terms of a full program for what we do to end food insecurity for everybody, I think a much more global uh, conversation conversation has to happen about how capitalism and what it does, not just to produce poverty by creating massive unemployment, not just to what it does to housing and land access by making so many people landless and um, without access to any assets, but what it also does to food in general. And why when food is produced for a profit, and not for consumption, the only consequence of that is going to be massive hunger and poverty all across the world. What's wonderful is that, um, I, I can respond to all of this by saying, yes, you're right. Um, well, because th this is, this is a one chapter in a book with uh, chapters on land reform and anti-capitalist activity. And um, uh, so I, 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 what's interesting about this is, you're, you're right to know that this is a, a, an example of a, an area where people do have land. And in fact, what, what's, I mean, this, that, that's, that, that to me is the, the, the critique here, is that at some level this is challenging patriarchy, but not, I mean, this is still a feudal economy. Um, and so what's, you know, what, what's interesting is that it flourishes under the sort of benevolent eye of a village headman. Um, so am I then saying that really what we need to do is get back to, you know, what we need is just benign dictators? Well, no, I mean, I, I think the, 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 the interpretation I prefer, uh, though you, you needn't give it to me, is that uh, what you have here is, first of all, again, the, the sort of peer-to-peer -peer organized, just people uh, understanding that they are more powerful and they're able to be more, uh, more politically and technically savvy than they have ever been allowed to be. And I think that, that I, I would submit to you all that that's, that, that sort of power of critical reflection when it comes to either modifying the, the, the external world in terms of you know, figuring out seed, uh, you know, how to grow more from your land without relying on Monsanto, or uh, figuring out how to uh, actually get men to cook. These are techniques and skills that we have had taken away from us because these are all technical problems in the world of, of uh, food security. But, but I, th I do think, I mean, the, the, the one issue where, where I push back a little bit is this isn't about productive labor, this is about reproductive labor. This is about getting men to cook. Um, you know, in, in the same way, I mean, in, in the US, we might go for Silvia Federici's idea of paid housework, which I, th I think is a great idea. Here, of course, there's no currency to pay housework. And, and instead, there, what, 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 I mean, the, the issue is absolutely around women's, I mean, Often when I, when I do the sort of Q&A, not Q&A, the sort of participatory action bit, where I say, well, you've got these problems of lots of people, you know, you've got lots of food and uh, not enough, uh, you know, and, and still there's a pediatric malnutrition, how do you solve it? And people f eventually get to breastfeeding. And then, the, and then, so how do you solve this problem of, uh, uh, what, what do you do to, to end child malnutrition when you, when you understand that the problem is, is that women have to breastfeed? And some people will say, well, get men to harvest. Why don't we get the men to harvest? Because uh, then surely that would be fine. But in fact, women were very keen to maintain control over, uh, over the harvest because actually that, that ends up being a, a, a sort of site of struggle. Um, and what they want is men to cook. And getting men to engage in reproductive labor, it seems to me, is a global struggle, um, uh, I, I, I would submit. Um, 
I mean, having, I'm, I'm, I'm the one who does the dishes, but I, I, I'm just saying, uh, th this idea of men's, uh, uh, I mean, men's reproductive work mm. and actually equality in the household is a struggle that, we, that is just as important in the United States as it is elsewhere. I mean, obviously, uh, I don't have to tell this room about uh, the, the sort of wage disparities, but I also don't have to, to tell this room about uh, the disparities in terms of productive versus reproductive labor. And it, it, it seems to me that there, there's, there's, if we're interested in subverting capitalism, one of the most interesting sort of potent parts of this is the challenge that capitalism can never sustain, which is the idea of uh, recognizing the importance of reproductive labor um, and uh, uh, valuing reproductive labor. I mean, if capitalism were to value reproductive labor, it would fall apart. I mean, if, it were, if there were, I mean, not a market in reproductive labor, but actually a full cost accounting of reproductive labor. And by reproductive labor, I'm using the sort of Marxist technical term of understanding not just uh, the, the work of bearing children, but of uh, sustaining communities, of doing all the paid care, oh, sorry, the unpaid care work, uh, the, the, the work of, of uh, education, of, 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 you know, of um, you know, everything from cooking, cleaning, fetching firewood to, uh, you know, the, the, the work of building and sustaining maintaining communities that is not paid for by capitalism, but which capitalism needs in order to be able to thrive. If we were to pay for that, uh, if, if capitalism, I mean, capitalism can't internalize that huge external cost. And, you know, there, there, there are these movements to try and get capitalism to internalize its externalities. This is uninternalizable because it's part of the way that capitalism uh, operates, is to externalize this core part of itself, the, 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 the making and the sustaining of a working class. The production of that cannot be paid for by capitalism itself. So I, I think that there's something very interesting about that, but, but I, 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 I'm with you. I think, you know, in terms of prefigurative politics, I think that there is a role for prefigurative politics when, it follow, when it's followed up with the door-to-door -door organizing that's informed by not just, oh, isn't this awesome, but here's feminist organizing and here's how, we, how we're going to make that happen. I mean, I, I think there's a role for both. I think in order to get men interested and to be able to break through the cultural taboos around cooking that we saw there, you needed something fun. I mean, it's, it's one thing to come with one's newspaper, for example, and say, comrades, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just out of the blue. Uh, but, but, you know, just make comrades, it, th this is the road to emancipation. People are like, oh, that's fucking great. Yeah, no, oh, really? And the, and the solution is worker struggle. And the solution is worker struggle. And the, uh, but but there's, there's another way of doing that, which is kind of fun. And this is the joy of doing food stuff, right? Where, where you, you get to say, look, here is, here's... Here's some great food. Here's everyone. Everyone, come around the pot. This is awesome. Everyone have a good time. And then the solution is workers' struggle. And we're like, oh yeah, I could, I could go for that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's just, it's just more fun uh, to have these moments of prefigurative politics followed by the hard. Yeah, I mean, th there was nothing sort of, hey, everyone having fun uh, in this moment of feminist conf confrontation. You know, where, where you saw uh, everyone sitting around having that awkward moment, uh, and and wh when you saw. Anita kicking ass and taking names, you know, sort of whipping out the Bible when she needed to, and she just, just, just using. She was, she was a great organizer right there, and it was uncomfortable. That wasn't fun. That was just, that was, that was straight politics, uh, and it was tough feminist organizing, and it was hard, and. Uh, in, in almost every other case that we've seen, that gets the job done. In fact, Winston is, is, a, is a really is, is a bit of an outlier in this. Um, but it seems to me that there, there is a role for joyful moments followed by tough you know, and informed politics around the role, you know, the way that capitalism uh, needs to be overthrown. So I'm, I'm with you on that. And I, I definitely think that uh, issues around access to land, which is in the next chapter of the book, uh, and if, if you ever have me back, I will, uh, I promise to, to talk more about uh, land access. There's some really interesting stuff happening around that. Um, I, I, I do think that access to the means of production is important. I think that just, just the story here is just interesting because it's, you know, it, it, it takes, I mean, what, 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 in the way that it topples the idea of you know, the genius who's going to solve this and instead distributes the, the, the sensibility and the intelligence in a, from a, of a community away from, dude, I'm going to put vitamins in this and you'll be fine, to a, a much more kind of, look, what we need is, uh, you know, we need time to breastfeed. How do we get time to breastfeed? Well, we, we need men to do the cooking. And how do we do that? We have to confront patriarchy. And how do we do that? We have, you know, it, that's just a much tougher way, but it, it, it brings results much quicker than adding vitamins to things. So anyway, that, 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 that's what I, I submit. That basically, I agree with you. So, uh, so thanks. <laughs> uh, but uh, should we take questions maybe in groups of three so that I can write down the things that you say? In terms of saying no to foreign investment, I, 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 I don't know of any community that's kind of said uh, no explicitly to uh, <coughs> international investment because in general the circumstances under which a, a country would be able to say that tend to be rare, right? I mean, the, the reason that Malawi, for example, signed up to this uh, accord was uh, it wasn't random. It happened because Malawi was 
being pushed towards a debt crisis, not of its own making, but because the IMF had devalued. And so all of a sudden, Malawi needed foreign capital in a hurry. And, it, uh, and uh, at, the, at the same moment as the IMF took things away, uh, the, the government was said and it uh, was ushered towards. But you know, we, we know that we're, we're you, you just balanced your budget, and now it's imbalanced because you had to devalue your currency and you're hemorrhaging dollars. Luckily, we have some buddies over here, some Norwegians who have quite a lot of dollars who they want to give you if you sign up to this partnership. So bear in mind that the, the history of African countries being able to make free choices on the international arena is pretty, you know, it's pretty narrow. Uh, I mean, you know, th there have been examples where, for example, Zambia has said no to gen genetically modified crops because very reasonably they didn't have a biosafety protocol in place to be able to uh, you know, admit or not admit things. So to that extent, you've been able to see stuff. But it's also important to know, I mean, in, in that graph back there, there was, um, there was a little bit blip where South Africa, for example, was busy investing in things. Um, and there have been communities who've, who've said no to South African capital because, uh, again, in Zambia, uh, the, the Zambians burned down a South African supermarket because of the way that that chain was treating local suppliers. Uh, so, I mean, th there have been examples um, where you know communities have said, well, bugger that. We're not, you know, aimed at a specific kind of uh, intervention or a specific sort of force of capital. But in, in terms of the general, no, we are going to do it all by ourselves. Uh, I, I don't think that there's that been given that sort of autonomy or that kind of, that, that, that kind of space or that kind of freedom to be able to, to say that. I mean, to be able to say that would, would take a fight. I mean, the, the only example I really know of, of something approaching that was at the World Trade Organization in 1999, where. Um, and I just so happened to be on the Zimbabwean delegation on the inside as well as protesting on the outside. I was shuttling backwards and forwards, so I could see both sides. It was very interesting. And what, what, what I saw was that, you know, the, initially the African delegation were just being treated incredibly badly by the U.S. hosts. You know, they would have their little meeting room and the U.S. hosts would be like, you, out, uh, because they needed it for, you know, Cargill to caucus or something. Uh, and... Uh, that combined with the sort of outrage that was coming from the streets allowed Afri the Africa caucus to say no to the World Trade Organization uh, draft in 1999, which was kind of unheard of. It was a very rare moment in history, but it was possible. <laughs> um, so that, that kind of thing has happened, and you know, one hopes that it may continue. But uh, I, you know, in general, I'm not, you know, I, I don't think, uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware of sort of specific communities constituting, does, that, does anyone know of, uh, of anything like that? Uh, nothing immediately jumps to mind, yeah. Well, I mean, yes, there, so there, there was, a, a, a thank you so much. There, there, there was a terrific conference up in Seattle a few weeks ago now where there was kind of a Bill and Melinda Gates watch or, and African farmers are kind of watching where this unaccountable money goes because who's going to watch, right? Who's, who's watching the, the largest private foundation in the world? Well, the second largest, if, the IKEA foundation apparently is the largest foundation in the world, uh, but its sole beneficiary is the guy who set it up. Um, so uh, so the, the second... Largest, but, but you know the, the um, so the Bill and Melinda. I mean, yeah, there the, the, you, you'll you'll see them, uh, you know, floating around in clouds of smug. Uh, but they're the, you know, they're, they're offering you know that they're you know we we are you know, we're here to fight hunger, we're here to fight poverty, and and farmers are uh, you know, organized to be able to fight back against that. But I'm not sure they you know the extent to which they have the the the, the force uh, as you know as nations, for example, to be able to say no bugger off. Um, so, uh, but, but keeping an eye on it is a very good idea. Now, in terms of um, urban policy, I th that, that's, that's, that's a really interesting question. You raised that too. Um, I mean, I, I've done some, uh, in fact, work in slums in South Africa with the uh, Abathlali Basim John Dole's fantastic shack dweller movement uh, in, based out of Durban, but um, uh, spreading throughout South Africa now, uh, also active in Cape Town and a few other places. Uh, and what's interesting about them is that they have very interesting, they have ideas about the world without slums that they want to live in. And they're very keen still, and this may be a generational issue, uh, th to be able to have a vibrant rural economy because they're not very happy about living in slums. The reason they, uh, and they're very, they're very clear about the reason that they live in slums is precisely the kinds of trajectory that Snehal was talking about, where you know, we had, uh, you know, my, my, my father, my grandfather, my you know, grandmother, my, grandf my, you know, my, my mother was able to farm, and then we were able no more. And so then we had to come to the city because of these improving technologies or because the local landowner just kicked us off our land so that they could grow row crops and monoculture. And what we need is a return to polyculture, which I think is you know, part of what this is about. But so what, what uh, shack dwellers are keen on doing is, is a sort of two-stage process. One, actually being able to occupy land to be able to grow food. So some of the settlements do have food growing there. Um, but much more, that what they want is a, a rural policy that lets them get the hell out of the city uh, and get back to a rural area that has investment in things like 
hospitals and good schools and good paying jobs uh, and light industry and the, the kind of quality of life that they came to the city for in the first place. Uh, but it, it seems to me that that's, uh, you know, th that, that is something that has to be fought for because what you have overwhelmingly in development policy these days is urban bias. I, mean, I, I was telling the story of NAFTA um, to people who, who don't know. I mean, you're, you're familiar with NAFTA, right? Uh, so maybe you may be less familiar with how agriculture got into NAFTA. Because agriculture, I mean, when the US and Canada were negotiating with Mexico, they were like, well, obviously, you know, we're going to send, uh, you know, send our steel to you in Mexico. And Mexico, obviously, yes, you are. And uh, obviously, you know, we're, we're going to send our electronics. And, you know, obviously, yes, yes, you are. And then the Mexican, said, the Mexican government said, well, we, we need to put agriculture on the table. And the US said, well, obviously, we're not going to stop subsidizing our farmers. And, you know, that, that's going to destroy your rural economy. Uh, and the Mexican government said, well, not destroy, uh, but uh, you know, help our peasants move out of being the peasantry into being modern workers. They, they had an idea that the peasantry were hopelessly backward and what they needed to be doing was moving to the cities and getting jobs so that they could be part of the working, you know, uh, uh, part of the proletariat. Obviously. Uh, and obviously it happened. And obviously that's exactly you know, the, 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 the kinds of outcome that the Mexican government wanted came to pass, where it, farming became an unsustainable activity and then people moved to uh, you know, urban areas to be able to get jobs that stayed there for as long as it took capital to work out that they could be getting that, those jobs done much more cheaply in China. Uh, and so you had the, the hop of people from rural to urban to unemployment happening you know, within the, the course of 10 years. Now, I, I think that, that's a, you know, that it, it's really interesting to notice that urban bias in you know, even coming from Mexico. Again, when you hear the story of NAFTA, it's like evil US corporations, good Mexico. But no, it, it, it's in fact a sort of a, a class collaboration, a very interesting one. Uh, that is about destroying the peasantry and reconfiguring it in an interesting way. Uh, but I think when we're interested in, in thinking about urban food policy, and particularly when thinking about the United States, then the thing to worry about is poverty. I mean, this isn't, this isn't just about, um, you know, the, uh, uh, about Malawi. 50 million Americans are food insecure. That's a poverty problem. That's not a, that's not a kind of, well, you know, we need better labeling problem. It's a poverty problem. Uh, and it seems to me that the way you fight that is through uh, I mean, are people f familiar with Thomas Piketty, uh, the author of Capital in the 21st Century? A global maximum wage and a global minimum wage seem to me like good ideas. Uh, and a, a, a living wage in the United States is a tremendously good idea. Now, the way we get to a living wage is not by wishing for it, but by organizing. Um, and that's not the sort of thing that you see on the side of a package, right? I mean, and if you're interested in good, nutritious food in the United States, then it may come as a shock to realize that on uh, but, but, but how much are food stamps per meal? Do you know? Maybe a buck sixty if you've got the wind behind you. Um, that's not enough to be able to get good, nutritious food. Um, so I mean, you know, it doesn't matter who's doing the cooking. If, if you're getting, if you're living on food uh, on SNAP on uh, for food and time with a su su supplementary nutritional assistance program, um, uh, that's just. You know, that, that's a poverty issue. So it, it seems to me that, that uh, actually ta tackling poverty uh, is important. And if we're in interested in tackling poverty, you know, sure, I'm happy to have private participation. If the private sector is going to bring in $20 an hour minimum wage, then that's great. That's the kind of private participation I want to see. But I don't think it'll happen um, by asking the private sector to do that. Uh, you know, we're seeing plenty of opportunities where the private sector could pay 20 bucks an hour, and they don't seem to be keen on it. Uh, so it seems to me that the, the answer there is, again, to set aside the private sector and recognize that the right to food is more important, even here in the United States. Now, yes, nutritional labeling, that's great. I, I actually think that um, th there's a country that's way ahead of the United States. Well, most countries are ahead of the United States. But, but the, the, the country that, that, that's really excitingly ahead of, this, uh, ahead of us on this is Brazil. Brazil just announced its dietary guidelines. And we have someone represented from Brazil. Uh, uh, so uh, Brazil has, has just published its dietary guidelines. And, and the number one dietary guideline in Brazil is not make sure you consume uh, you know, your RDA of vitamin A and B and C and D. And, you know, uh, there's none of that. Instead, the, the number one uh, sort of recommendation is cook your meals at home if you can. And the number 10 recommendation is don't believe what fast food companies tell you. Uh, I mean, th there's a provision in the national uh, guidelines not to believe what you are told on television. Um, now, that's important because uh, and, and they want to push that forward a little bit. There's, a, there's an agency that is tasked with the rights of children in Brazil. Uh, and one of their uh, recommendations is to ban all advertising, not just of food, but everything to children. 
Now, that's a food issue, because how is it, do you think, that we form the kind of crappy tastes for what passes for food in this country? It doesn't happen by magic. I mean, it happens through that, you know, we see the salt, fat, sugar sort of uh, you know, high chemistry and sorcery of uh, the food industry at work, but marketing has a lot to do with it. So our desires for food are not just innate things. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I caused trouble the other day by saying that, for example, the desire for meat wasn't a, a natural ingrained thing, but it was marketed to us. And people are like, no, everyone wants to eat meat. It's a natural part of being human being. Um, <laughs> Uh, and of course, you know, this is a room full of Americans. If I, if I said this to a room full of Jains, for example, or a, a room full of Hindus, everyone would be like, yeah, obviously. You know. um, but, 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 I mean, it, it's, just, it, it's very interesting that the, the, way, the, the way we desire things is something that capitalism has sold us, right? I mean, the, the, the reason that the US diet is so bad is not an accident, it is a profitable diet. Um, and sure, we can put little, little indications of what it is that's good and bad, but surely it would be better not to introduce those things in the first place, particularly to children who have, as we know, you know uh, reduced capacities for reason, and that's why we don't let children carry guns. Not even in Texas do we allow that. Um, <laughs> or do we? Do we? Really? It's like six-year-olds with guns? Oh, good God. All right, I'll have, I'll have to change that part of the talk. Oh, Mary, mother of... Anyway, but we don't let them vote. Uh, so there we are. Uh, we, we, we don't let them vote in Texas unless they have the gun permit, right? <laughs> There's no getting away from it. But, but point being, you know, uh, so the marketing, I think, is something that needs to be controlled. And uh, that seems to me a much, uh, you know, that's a lesson to learn. And again, what, what you saw here in the recipe day was uh, a, a sort of way of transforming desire. I mean, here, here are things like, you know, cow pee and millet. Uh, and uh, historically, people have eaten that. But you, you, they discovered that by deep frying things, it tastes way better. Uh, and and by, by coming up with new recipes for these foods, uh, they can e make eating healthy a, a fun thing to be doing. Uh, and figuring out those recipes and figuring out those new skills, I think that that's an important part of what this teaches us as well. Um, but I also you know, I definitely think that, that fighting poverty is an important thing to do. And I think that, that, that teach, that, that's something we learn from here as well. So yeah, uh, I mean, uh, patent law, um, I'm, uh, it, it's certainly clear that, that what the... Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are keen on is uh, the, the best varieties available for monoculture. And, and I, I think that that's, that's one of the stories here, is that um, the, the kind of model, the kind of, uh, of thinking that's driving this kind of new agriculture forward is a celebration, an uncritical celebration of monoculture. Because uh, monoculture, my, you, you know, the, the, you just plant one crop and you, you plant row upon row upon row of, upon row of this one crop. Uh, and it, the idea of turning the, f the fields into factories where you just plant one of something is, again, historically, un, you know, it, it, it's, it, I mean, it, it's been successful when there's been all the other sort of accoutrements of uh, modern agriculture. So where, when there are markets for the one crop, and when all people want are the one crop, and where there are people prepared to pay for just the one crop uh, in a global kind of system of markets. But the global system of food markets, for example, I mean, the, the, the global food market's pretty young. I mean, the, the first global food market is, what, 150 years old. That's a global market in wheat. And in order to be constructed, the global market in wheat required the colonization of India, uh, uh, colonization of China, uh, well, not colonization, but, but the, the annexing of China and the, the, the forcing of China to, uh, to, to use, to, 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 to consume opium in exchange for tea. This is uh, something from, uh, uh, that you can read in Mike Davis's absolutely required reading, uh, uh, Late Victorian Holocausts. Um, it's, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. Uh, and and what, what it talks about is the spread of the, the global free market and where, you know, in order for the global free market to look the way that it looks, uh, 50, sorry, 30 million people needed to die, not because there was a shortage of food, but because uh, the new rules of exchange were re required so that uh, you had workers who were you know, loading the food onto, uh, onto trains that would be sent to Calcutta, that would be sent to Britain, uh, so that the workers in Europe could have cheap wheat. Uh, and those workers in India who were growing the wheat, surrounded by wheat, died uh, because they, you know, they, their wages were too low to be able to buy food. Which helps bring, so, so you know, that idea of monoculture is one that I think the, the, the lead, our leaders are keen on. And they're very keen on uh, whoever it is that can promise um, you know, new improvements. So uh, Jeffrey Sachs, I mean, Jeffrey Sachs, 
very dangerous man, uh, uh, and now bitter, thank God. Uh, I, I mean, uh, after his years of you know, proselytizing Jeffrey Sachsism, um, he, he's, he now thinks that, that you know, the only thing that's going to change the world is social movements, which I'm very pleased about. Uh, but, uh, he, I mean, he, he once offered that, well, what if there's a gene for climate change? Uh, what if genetically modified crops can save the world uh, in terms of climate change? And, and again, the infrastructure for um, this kind of uh, you know, these kinds of crops is, is, being, you know, is being created by creating the, you know, the, the, the agro-dealership network, by eviscerating the private sec uh, sorry, the, the, the public research in seeds, by getting rid of scientists, uh, publicly funded scientists who could do agroecology, and instead having the kinds of concentration of knowledge in, uh, in the private sector where there are just, you know, you tweak the seed, you patent it, which is covered by WTO law in any case, uh, and then you, you make that available. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I don't think that there's specifically sort of GMO technology being uh, pushed forward as part of the, the accords, but it, it's certainly the case that Monsanto is doing very well out of the agro-dealer network, uh, and it's certainly true that the, the system of global monoculture is doing very well. I mean, the, the, when the largest single funder is a fertilizer company, that to me is, is a problem. And this isn't to say that African soils don't need amendment in, in a one-off sort of process, uh, but to, to get Africans, uh, African agriculture hooked on this system of permanent uh, renewal of soil and evisceration of soil chemistry and, and bio, uh, biology through the, ad the addition of inorganic fertilizer, that's a problem. So you're, you're, I mean, I think that rather than worrying about GMOs, which are already locked into place by WTO agreements on intellectual property, the bigger worry is about monoculture. Uh, and I suppose the biggest worry is the opportunity cost. Right? The opportunity cost of going down this route of row crops and row crops and row crops is, uh, a different way of farming where you can get more out of the soil and you have more nutritious food available and you have uh, a range of other you know, alternatives. But the, those alternatives aren't on policymakers' mind. They never get to hear about them. And I think, you know, uh, to be honest, uh, assuming that, that policymakers aren't bastards, um, which sometimes is, is a fair assumption to make, I mean, I, I think that uh, here they, they're, they're going for the biggest return on their dollar. And that's a problem because. I mean, when one thinks of the, the, the big leaps forward in, uh, in terms of fighting uh, uh, of human rights, although there may have been a dollar tag attached to it, the dollar tag didn't come first, and then the human rights second. It's always, this needs to be done as a, as a human rights priority, uh, and yes, we will pay for it. Uh, but, you know, for example, I mean, so, so someone was saying, look, if, if we'd actually had the bill up front for something like Medicare or Medicaid, would it have happened? If, we, if we'd had a, a legion of health economists uh, giving us the numbers about, well, this, it'll cost this much to do this much dialysis in the United States, you know, we have socialized uh, care in the United States for, for kidneys, for example. Um, you know, one organ's medicine has been socialized in the United States. And, uh, and you know, if, if we had all the data for doing that and all the numbers and all the dollar value for doing that, would we have done it? Uh, and the chances are we probably wouldn't um, because the, the price tag associated with, with some of the, the healthcare interventions in the United States are ridiculous. But we made the choice because it was the right thing to do. Uh, and it seems to me that, that policymakers are trapped in, in this kind of ass backwards world of letting uh, the choice of what is right and what is not be dictated by what is affordable and what isn't rather than the other way around. Uh, and so it seems to me that, that when, insofar as policymakers are choosing, they're, they're choosing between very limited parameters because they, they have an eye not on the just but on the affordable. Um, and that, that seems to me to lead us down the avenues that in the United States where the word affordable appears. Uh, and you, 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 you can imagine what those are. But I, I, I think that, that in terms of justice, in terms of what the policymakers are looking at, they're not, they're not being presented with, first of all, the affordability of something like agroecology and food sovereignty. Uh, but they're also not being, you know, they're, they're thinking within very limited kind of parameters. And this seems to offer a lot of bang for the buck, even though my money, and I will take anyone's bet, that the number of people lifted out of poverty here will be far different from something like uh, a food seeds and uh, so soils, food and healthy communities initiative. And insofar as this does succeed, it'll happen much, th much more through a rejigging of numbers rather than through actual uh, poverty uh, being, being ended. So to, to get to the economic system then, I mean, it seems to me that when we're talking about an economic system that's premised on, and you, and you, you can see where I'm going and, and you're, you're unhappy about it, and I'm sorry about that, but, 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 uh, but I mean, you, you can see that, that <laughs> an international sort of a, a, a agricultural system that's, that depends on making food available to the highest bidder, it seems to me runs afoul of the right to food. Um, so. How do, we, how do we address that? Well, certainly, we have to make some basic commitments around making sure that people's right to food trumps the right to property. It, at some level, either we make that choice or we don't, right? I mean, either we let people go hungry or we do not. 
Uh, if we make the choice that we don't want anyone to go hungry, then it seems to me the right to property does need at some point to be subsumed to other kinds of rights. And it's a good question to ask, well, what, what are those rights? Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very keen on the idea, because uh, I'm, I'm a bit more suspicious of the state than Sneha is, uh, that, uh, or maybe not. No, okay, we're, we're, we're equally suspicious of the state. Um, so th then, uh, I mean, it, it seems to me that the, the kind of widespread uh, you know, w you know, worker and community control of food, that actually the, 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 uh, the, the community here uh, has its own seed bank uh, and its own grain store because it doesn't trust the government and the government actually has been very unreliable in providing all those things. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I think that there are um, communities, I mean, the, the, the the creation of buffers and of community seed banks and of community uh, you know, grain banks uh, where exchange happens and you know, where, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I think that free exchange uh, between uncoerced individuals is terrific. Um, and it's just that the system we live in at the moment is the opposite of that. You know, capitalism is the anti kind of exchange uh, where people are coerced all the time. I think uh, free exchange where people own the means of production is a terrific idea. Uh, now, whether that happens under um, you know, cooperatives or whether that happens under well, uh, the village level, I think that's up for people to decide themselves and to fight for themselves. Uh, but I, I certainly think the cooperatives are a terrific way to go. But I, I think that people b having the sovereign right to be able to decide when to violate the right to property in order to make sure that everyone gets fed um, and making sure that the right to food is the one that gets respected rather than property is the way to go. What this uh, model was about was uh, trying to figure out ways where to, to stop men doing those kinds of interventions with their buddies, right? Where um, you have stories of, you know, I mean, you, you saw Winston saying, well, what about, you know, won't, uh, won't, won't my friends see me and think that I'm under her petticoat government? Um, and, uh, the, I mean, w one of the things about uh, the, the recipe day that's, that's very different from an individual kind of administering of like go around, teach people to cook and move on, um, is that it presents a kind of a, 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 a different kind of normal and makes it possible for, for there publicly to be a different kind of normal where men get to cook. Uh, and those men pounding soybeans are doing, so some of them are doing it for the first time, some of them are very practiced. Uh, but seeing it and for it to be okay, for, for everyone to recognize and to be open about a conversation where no one has had witchcraft cast upon them, um, where there is no sort of petticoat government being offered because people are going into this freely. That, that experience of seeing, seeing that, thing, that stuff happening and for it to be normal is part of what the program is about. So initially where uh, there's a moment of, um, you, you know, where, where th th this thing happens for the first time in a community, th you, you will, th the men who are not part of it are looking on aghast, just as Winston was. And, you know, th th there, are, there are always men sitting around the side. But the men who get in the middle and do it are not being prevented by the men at the side, which is often what would happen <laughs> for the first time uh, if this were happening as a sort of solo effort. Uh, so, in part, this is, this is the, the sort of outcome of many, it many iterations of the attempt to try and try this out in, in new and different communities. I'm not sure what, what would happen uh, if, you know, if, if the community sort of rallied round and said, no, we prefer things just the way they are. Um, but, I mean, I, I will ask the next time I'm there, but I, I, I don't think that, that it's happened because in general to be part of this, one also has to have been part of the farmer research team where you learn some of the skills about, you know, and anyone can, who is around the table can talk. Uh, and that already is uh, quite a stretch for, for some of the men who are not used to being around a table where women are often the better seed savers and uh, you know, farming experts. Uh, but that's, you know, having seen ample evidence of that, there, there seems to be much more openness to that. Now it's interesting then, I mean, I guess, I, 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 w when I see this, I, I see something that's immediately relevant to the United States. And I, I, I guess m maybe, I, 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 I I look at it and I, I see the, the kinds of uh, uh, patriarchy that are alive and well here. Um, and and may, maybe I'm just missing how, how unusual and strange it is because it seems to me that, that there are, you know, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, well, I mean w w what's weird and African about it? Well, I, I'm saying nothing. I mean, I, 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 I guess my, my, my in, in terms of engaging with, I mean, I, I, it seems to me that there's something very universal about um, the, uh, you know, the, the reluctance of men to get involved in reproductive labor and about the need to overcome that and how feminism and feminist organizing can help with that. But maybe, well, I, I'm, I'm clearly, I'm, I'm having a brain fart moment here because I'm, I'm just, 
I'm failing to engage with that, that part of the question. I really, and since Snehal also said, I'm, I really want to understand it. Yes, oh, I see what you mean, okay, yeah. And, and that's right, I mean, I, I think, you know, if, uh, I mean, the, 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 the language being used there was tumbuka, um, but if you heard that there was a word that popped, and that's gender, J-E-N-D-A, which is the tumbuka word for gender. Um, and, you know, it's, it's obviously a, a, a word import, it's obviously, a, you know, borrowed language. Um, and it's come, I mean, it's circulated through the NGO world, uh, and it's come to mean a whole bunch of different things, right? You know, doing gender uh, is uh, w what s some people will call, you know, that, that sort of performance of going to a gender workshop. Not, the, not doing gender in the Judith Butler sense, but doing gender as in, you've gone to a gender workshop, now you know how to do gender. And I think that that's a very interesting kind of, oh, and, and in, in that case, yes, I mean, the, the, the idea, I mean, it, Caliban and the Witch is a, a really interesting book. If, if people are familiar with Caliban and the Witch, uh, Silvio Federici's really, really interesting uh, and magisterial account of how colonialization uh, actually helps to structure gender roles in, uh, uh, in the global south. And so um, witchcraft is this thing that becomes a way in which women are dispossessed uh, and uh, be become oppressed in new, uh, in new ways under capitalism. You know, whenever you see uh, you know, just a quick flag. Of whenever you hear about mm -hmm. accusations of witchcraft being leveled in Africa, which occasionally those things will appear in U.S. newspapers, uh, you know, this many women executed for witchcraft. Uh, usually, those were women who were standing up for their rights, or you know, <coughs> were on land that the local village headman wanted, and they ended up being accused of witchcraft and then dispossessed of of property. Um, so I, I certainly think that that the ideas that circulate around witchcraft, for instance, are are, are ones that gain currency when title to property becomes very important. Uh, and and th th there's a long history of that. But what's interesting here is that not that this is a pre-capitalist community, but it's, it's just that, that um, th there's been, uh, I mean, if it, the, the, the sort of tentacles of capitalism haven't, uh, the, I, I, the word penetration is just not the right word, but it's, it's not the, uh, and, and there, there's, this, again, this, this literature of capitalism having reached and transformed places. And of course, everywhere has been reached and transformed by, by modern capital. Uh, but I, uh, what, what's happened here, I, it seems to me, has been structured by experiences of colonialism, experiences of the state and of who it is that is allowed to know things. And I, and I think that maybe that's a, a nice way of answering is, this, is that what this is, is in a, in a sense a response to the way that Mal the Malawian state uh, has been, has controlled agricultural knowledge uh, and, and invested its sort of source in men who know how to plant things. Uh, and in a sense, that, that, that inequality has already been, you know, made itself present in the fields. But I think I, I, you know, this is a conversation we need to have uh, that's going to last a long time. But I, I'd also want, want to just finally to end on uh, rights and neoliberalism. Uh, I mean, I, th I think the idea of rights by themselves, well, you know, I mean, there's the idea of, you know, talk of rights without being able to implement them is nonsense on stilts, right? I mean, um, uh, and what, what's interesting is, is the idea here of, uh, people fighting for a right to have rights, um, the, the ability to be able to make claims on uh, you know, other sovereign agencies where they have those rights delivered, um, and whether those agencies are you know, a community or um, you know, their, their local sort of village uh, uh, governing body, I think th th those are all important. So I mean, I certainly see that, that you know, rights can be used to mop up after neoliberalism, but the, I mean, the, the latest interpretation of the right to food isn't about um, you know, just uh, making sure that people have enough to eat and then uh, that, you know, has enough vitamins and then they're happy. Um, but it's much more about uh, food sovereignty. It's about an idea of communities being able to democratically control their, their access to food. Um, and if the special rapporteur on the right to food did nothing else, he, he did a, a great job in broadening the right to food <coughs> beyond just making sure that there were plates full and that, that they would be you know, respected and monitored and, you know, and restored and all the rest of that. Uh, but much more in terms of community control over making sure that the food gets to, uh, you know, the, the way that the food gets to a plate. Um, and that, that idea of, of the right to food and that interpretation of the right to food isn't compatible with neoliberalism because it involves democracy and democracy and neoliberalism couldn't be, could be less compatible. And maybe that's the place to end. Thanks very much. Thank you.